Welcome to Social Distillation, a submarine still of the internet, where we attempt to drop the bead and pour white lightning straight onto your brain. And today's white lightning comes courtesy of Robert Jordan again. We're going to be getting back to the great hunt because I'm procrastinating and I don't want to talk about Ukraine yet. <laughs> uh, we left off last time uh, with them just setting off to begin the hunt uh, for the horn. Um and there's well before we get into it do you have any thoughts on on the hunt in general or on the, the starting out of it uh nothing that we didn't hash in last time because we we, mm -hmm. we basically the, the first was it nine chapters that we went over last time is all set up for the motivations to yeah. go after to go after the horn and go after the dagger and and realistically not just the motivation to do it because it's kind of obvious it's it's the horn of valir but uh the the motivation for Rand to stay with the group to go after it i think that's the important part uh which all gets thrown on its head in the next few chapters um Something I didn't, I was flipping to the page, I was going for it, and I came across something uh, that kind of jumped out at me. When they're when they're riding along, when they get kind of out of Shinar and into the unaffiliated territory, if you will, and Ingtar goes on this kind of melancholy uh, explanation of, of what happened to these areas how there used to be they used to be part of something mm -hmm. and now people have, you know slowly left and the the nations that used to be there are gone uh i think we mentioned this early on in, in the eye of the world but uh humanity as as has been ebbing for a while uh since since the time of archer hawkwing so mm -hmm. they're they're there are fewer people and the the nations that they have a coalesced in are weaker than they used to be uh, they don't control as much territory they don't control as much prestige so the uh the it's something to keep in mind when the shadow starts winning and winning a lot well it's because humanity is in a bad position and Boom. the only thing that keeps them from getting overwhelmed right off the bat is the the shadow is taking a while to reestablish itself. Well, and this is kind of again the vastness of the territory that uh, this was our complaint about the show is they don't that's actually very important when we when we talked about diversity and actually lack of internal diversity between the areas. The yeah. only place with real borders that butt up against each other consistently is the borderlands. Yeah. Now, you know, even even probably the the most war happy couple, Ilian and Tyr, there's space between. Yeah, there's a there's a big kind of contested uh, area in this this giant open plain, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Inktar does mention that when he's when he's on his little rant here that at least in the borderlands, we had the blight to keep us together so that's mm -hmm. one of the main reasons those nations are more cohesive is because they have an actual um threat that has to be addressed um okay then we get into this really weird scene that i don't know that i've ever really understood um with the flies where rand gets kind of stuck in this weird loop where he's seeing this scene, this same scene play out over and over of uh, where this family's sitting down to dinner and then the Trollocs show up. Well, I think this was officially the first and we get, we get it big time in the third book. I, I, the second reading through, I didn't get it the first time either, mm -hmm. but the second reading through, I combined it with the bubbles of evil that are bubbling up from the, the, the breaking apart of the fabric of time. So that's what I that's what I kind of connected it to. I didn't think we got those that early. I didn't think that was book three. Well, I think I think that yeah, we got it in book three because okay. it didn't happen in oh no, no, it's book four. It's after the events, it, it's in tier. 
it's okay so no no more no more spoilers oh yeah, yeah 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 yeah, yeah. okay yeah. so all right so we may be seeing something that's not going to be named yet i had thought that what i remember a lot of speculation on the forums and i can't remember if this was ever confirmed that fane had somehow done this that this was one of his, the weird powers he has well but being now we're going to get metaphysical though mm-hmm is fane is part of the process of that fabric breaking apart everywhere yeah. he goes is everywhere he goes is tainted by eridol my shatter logoth and that that becomes the, the connection there becomes very important in the big thing that happens later so because that's that was that's what made it the only way for it to work because you had to get out of, outside of the fabric of space and time realistically and what better evil than shatter logoth to bubble up evil yeah you know, it's, I may it's have like, to it's go. Like, it's like you brought up flies, flies being attracted to the to mm-hmm. the death. You know, I may have to go l- looking this up again because I don't. I thought that this had been like addressed by Jordan in a Q and A at some point, um, but I could I couldn't find it uh, earlier. I may have to go doing some more digging. Um, but there there are quite a. I mean, I, I think I mentioned some in the eye of the world too of you know what was that uh well we talked about at the end of the eye of the world uh there there are some strange occurrences that happen Mm. with with relative frequency here yeah and and from Uh, moiraine's explanations to the boys earlier we're not giving any spoilers here yeah we talk about the world of dreams being important even though it hasn't come to the forefront as much yet uh but 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 she explains it in the first book and then we we speculated on the eye of the world being kind of a junction between uh-huh. the two and the bubbles of evil also were something similar to a breaking of yeah. that uh because they were they were also the similar to that same thing happening in the breaking the that yeah. barrier of reality down yeah and and fane again it becomes important in this because he is becoming slowly over the course of what we're going to talk about today the embodiment of evil Mm -hmm. evil even more evil than the evil they're originally fighting so yeah i think that's a good point because i got a way to put that too because because the dark represents the evil within man where the dark one represents the evil that that comes after man yeah the, the the dark one represents entropy and nihilism Mm -hmm. and Fane is something more death is something different it's a different kind of evil a more pure evil i think that's not um complicated by by chaos or any metaphysical you know goals it's just evil Fane is the right name because he he's becoming what we talked i think we talked about last time the dark empath Uh they have all all the worst things machiavellian uh, narcissism and uh psychopathy but also can feign humanity, mm-hmm. can feign empathy. And so uh, how much of this stuff Jordan did on purpose, we, we'd have to speculate because he's no yeah. longer around to yeah. answer for it. But, uh, but he had, a, well, he's like Arnold Schwarzenegger when it came to bodybuilding. This was a soldier that just kind of figured it out and was right about 75% of the time, even though mm-hmm. when you have him explain the science of it, he is completely wrong. He, you know, explaining how he got his bicep growth and he'll go through it and explain and his explanation. I'm like, no, you did it right, but you're wrong on why. Yeah. And sometimes I think that every time I read this, I'm like, Jordan was right on this quantum theory. Did he study physics? I don't know. You know, well, he got his bachelor's in physics. Remember? Okay. So, well, that, that explains the great hunt quite mm-hmm. a bit then. So, uh, um, the, uh, the next thing to jump out at me at the very beginning of chapter 11, page 188, the beauty of Wheel of Time curses and Uno being the, uh, oh, yeah. being the great purveyor of Wheel of Time curses that I don't, I don't remember them even using them in, uh, in the show. Uh, maybe no, I was just they, so annoyed at they all just the say, things. They just say fucking shit and bitch and stuff in the show. They curse like we do. Hmm. I must have been I must have been so annoyed at other things I didn't even notice that. But the goat kissing sheep swallow up bloody flaming, you know, sheep gutted milk drinker. They're glorious. I, I I just I love them. 
I think I've, I've read some people think they get a little old. Uh, I think he uses them sparingly enough and they're, they're colorful and different enough mm-hmm. uh, that it, I, I think it, it keeps it interesting through the whole series. What, I, I listened to John McWhorter and uh, Steven Pinker talk mm-hmm. about the, the, the progression of what we call curse words. And this, this is exactly how it was because you notice uh, even with modern curse words, they revolve around bodily fluids, excrement, and body parts and the dirtiness of what they can be. But in the past, they also revolved around animals and rotten food and things we, we, we look at. A curse is meant to get a reaction of disgust. Your insula lights up and you have an immediate disgust re- reaction. That's why they, you know, anything that you overuse loses its flavor. And, uh, and so Uno has no reaction to the words he says, as we find out later in the books, as he has trouble keeping his mouth under control. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so, so the history was, so he's, he's naming things that a lot of them were considered dirty at the time. And, uh, and so that's the progression of, of cursing and, uh, We'll get. I think we'll get in a, a bigger discussion on that uh, when we get to later Uno, because then you've got Uno and Elaine's interactions, uh, and Uno and Nynaeve's interactions, and I think that that'll that'll be the better place for that full full discussion. Maybe I'll read Nine oh. Nasty Words before then. Huh. John McCorder's book. Um. Is this where? Yeah. You still on 188? Yeah, I'm flipping through. I think we're, have we gotten to the scene with the murderall yet? Is that the next important? Oh, well, no, I think the, the next important is uh, when Ingtar tells Rand that uh, he's, he's second in command. Uh, that if anything happens to Ingtar, then he takes over. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we kind of talked about that last time with Moraine. See, seeing the uh, uh, the futility of planning and scheming in the face of the pattern when she's talking to Sawan, but she can't notice it in herself. And here she is again, trying to, you know, put a there's there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of imagery of uh, of horses and livestock uh, when Rand talks about this because it's it's a good metaphor of trying to be fit for a halter and blinders like a horse and be you know dragged to and the the whole, the whole, the old saying of lead a horse to water and that's that's what she's trying to do to Rand and he is reflexively jerking back uh, on the reins uh, and here she is pushing him again. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and you get a great sequence with, uh, with the three boys again, what we talked about the, the, the three personalities, the way they play off of each other, um, and the, the way each one kind of develops the other's character when they're around each other. Mm-hmm. Um, when, when Matt sees the banner, uh, Rand gets all ticked off that he's trying to be used as a false dragon. And so, Matt's freaking out and Perrin is just kind of squatting there looking at the banner thinking Mm -hmm. and then suddenly says, can you channel? And yep. So, and and we also kind of talked about this with Rand and his stubborn, stupid, it must be this way. All right, well, here it is. It's out in the open now and your friends are still your friends, Mm -hmm. Uh, which, you know, logically you should have seen, but he was so emotionally caught up that he couldn't, see to trust his friends with this Mm -hmm. Uh, i think i think we get to your scene next because we go into the the merge raw and then we get inside peyton fane's head yes after that so yeah yeah with the with the merge nailed to a door uh which is uh, pretty awesome and stark imagery. It's a mm-hmm. very well written scene, and then appropriately, it cuts to the perspective from Fane. So you've we've been following along, seeing 
the results for a couple of chapters now of the what has happened in the wake of uh, of the Dark Friends uh, movement, and now we get it from Fane. We get an idea of wh what we have been seeing. Not only that, this fact. is what we resisted to talk about when we saw him in Berlin. Yeah. Because now you, you get the things we, we didn't want to give away. You get the trauma he went through. You get the insight into how he was before that. And I mean, he was obviously bad enough to become a dark friend to begin mm -hmm. with. And he ended up becoming, <clears throat> he, was, he was abused. He was yeah. abused by the dark one and his minions into doing the, his bidding. And he's coming out of it like, uh, kind of like a, uh, you, you know, if you read about serial killers, you know, uh, 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 what's his name? He was in uh, Mind Hunter, Kemper, you know, and you, and you hear about the abuse he, he had as a child and then going up and why he's the way he is. Uh, you, you get a glance of that in this this next little passage, but then not only that, but he ended up coming across power later, and now because of the trauma of his past, he's going to direct this power a certain direction. Yeah. Uh, well, he says there. So this is page one ninety six where this scene starts, mm -hmm. and he's he's thinking through all the things that had happened, kind of a. A, a quick synopsis of what Moraine talked about at the end of Eye of the World after she interrogated him. Uh, what uh, it, interesting to me is that he thinks all this stuff through with a degree of detail, but then when it comes to Shadar Logoth, he had not wanted to go, but he had had to obey then. And then Shadar Logoth and then Ellipses. It, it, it just trails off. He's not going to think about that in detail which I find interesting, but he feels whole. Uh, he was whole within himself now. That was all that mattered. Mm -hmm. So it, to, to your point, those, those fractures within his psyche, those gaps in his psyche that had been created by the trauma from the Dark One and his minions, mm -hmm. Mordeth was able to fill all that in um and become something new and different but also because because fane had been hardened by all that trauma he wasn't completely consumed it was it was a synthesis it created something different mm -hmm. well and and there's there's a sort of helplessness you get when you're in that trauma and he came across the thing that made him not helpless anymore and not only that, he, it happened in a way where he's uh, realistically, what, what, what happened? Uh, you just turned your camera off, but we're still recording. So Can you hear anyway. me? Yep. Okay. This is why you shouldn't touch your thingy while you're in the middle of doing now something. Now a dog ran under my desk and touched <laughs> my thingy. Um, so do you have any more thoughts on Fane or should we move on to the next bit, which is the girls? Uh, let's move on to the next bit, which is... Okay. Difficult. So, uh, what should we talk about first? Should we rant about the series? Or... Let's rant about the series a little bit. Yeah. Um, because they're going to get... They, they start getting trained while they're on the boat on the way to the tower. They So, they start to get some training. Uh, and... Nynaeve's block is, is very key, not just to the plot points that are going to come, but it's integral to who she is as a character. Mm -hmm. And they completely brushed it over. They completely. Well, not only that, it downplayed it. It's the uh, might be my biggest complaint about the series, period, is they downplay the intricacy of learning the power. Yes. It's just this thing you have and you can use it badass style once you figure out you have it versus actually having to be taught yeah and they they tried to show it in that scene with Egwene and Perrin and the questioner um where she 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 tries so hard 
to embrace the source and she manages to do it and all she does is create this tiny flicker of flame Mm -hmm. that like does nothing but but then they when it's when it's no longer convenient they just brush by that and it's you know you 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 can do what you want when you want Mm -hmm. So Nynaeve can do this awesome thing uh, right off the bat uh, and, you know, more powerful, so powerful that Moiraine, who's one of the most powerful, like top five most powerful casters currently known to be alive and has been training for 20 years. And she's astounded at what Nynaeve does. Mm -hmm. And then they make it worse in the finale with, uh, with Agamar's, no, with Agamar's sister. Who is not Aes Sedai. She's she's like accepted, yeah. She's, yeah. she's, and she's you know, from tower a power trained, but she has no ability. Yeah. 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 From a power standpoint, we get the 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 circle, but at the same time, she she would not have the the expertise to create the weaves because she never had enough power to create the weaves to learn it. Yeah. I would she even have the expertise to know how to create a circle? Uh no. and, and then uh, and at, then, at most what we would see is she would know how to be accepted into a circle. At most, because yes. she wasn't even powerful enough to create the weave to create a circle. And so that, that yeah, that kind of. You have two out. completely untrained individuals in Uneven Egwene, and then the other random women who could channel somehow that show up, and they're able to wipe out an entire Trolloc army. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, because because it's there when you need it, like Moraine mm-hmm. said, I guess. Oy vey. Um The difficulty of it, uh, but then the the other part that comes along that is also problematic is uh, the the explanation of how you open yourself up and surrender to. Side R is very, very feminine. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the way you embrace the source is very feminine. And we've already seen a little bit of Rand talking about Satan, that it's, it's different. You grab hold of it. Mm-hmm. It's going to, there's going to be more detail as it progresses. And, and as Rand starts to get a little bit of control and he'll explain it further down down the road, but it is very masculine, uh, and that is on purpose. That is a, a central theme. It, it's why he uses the yin yang symbol to as the ancient symbol of the Aes Sedai. That it's it's masculine and feminine. It's it's not one is better than the other. It's they are complement different and complementary. And it's kind of funny because when you, uh, thank you, Sapolsky, for including this in your book. When you understand the steps to an orgasm for <laughs> males and females, he actually describes. Interesting analogy. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 well, and, and realistically, the way they describe the actual feeling of, of, of actually connecting to the mm-hmm. source is very orgasmic. That's a good point. Yeah. And, and the different ways that a female arrives to it versus a male. A male, so the flame in the void, right, is the first step, but then it is the grasping. You know, getting an erection is actually a parasympathetic response. That's why people who have high anxiety tend to have ED. So there is a lot of similarity to it when you break down uh, the physiology behind it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's 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 a good point because it. They talk about when when you you have both sides when you have embraced the source your senses are all heightened you mm-hmm. feel more alive and when you let it go that's actually something Egwene I think in this chapter yeah in this chapter she mentions a little bit of that releasing it is difficult but then it's it's dangerous if you let yourself become addicted to that pleasure mm-hmm. you have to learn to control and direct that pleasure appropriately well and and on the reread i did uh last year was after going through a lot of the stuff i did with alcohol and 
the understanding of addiction that he has in the writing of uh -huh. of, of the uh the, the satan and sadar connection i mean he's spot on so either he's had to deal with it himself or he knew people that that helped him with this or he he understood the psychology behind it but it really was spot on with the uh, the difficulties of of control not only controlling but even the, when you see somebody stilled or gentled how you feel after not having that substance that you're addicted to all right so then we get back to the hunt um and uh and so chapter 13 is is the beginning of the portal stone adventure where they they wake up in the other world and i know you want to talk about this because of the quantum physicsness of it uh yeah, uh, well, I think the first point I want to bring up is what we were just talking about in our complaints about the stone or the show, excuse me. Uh, Jordan also did include, though, that sometimes you do you accidentally do things mm -hmm. with this power. And uh, that actually even leads more credence to why you need to learn, because you can ac accidentally do things that could be very, very, very bad yeah. or good or indifferent. Be, because it's a part of you mm -hmm. it is you know it is it is it is as much a part of you as as any other physical trait or or personality trait that you have mm -hmm. uh and and just like you can react in a certain way be, because of those traits then using the power gets pulled into that mm -hmm. Uh, but again, this is just another area where we, we see the fabric of space and time kind of uh, be, well, I'm not even going to say it's going to be weakened because the portal stones were an age of legends thing. And the philosophers from that time that we'll call them the scientists, the Aes Sedai from that time figured out how to manipulate it. Yeah, well, it, it's something that predates the Age of Legends, and they used it in mm -hmm. the Age of Legends to learn how to do more and different things. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's realistically like a, a, a terrestrial version of us finding wormholes mm -hmm. in the universe. Uh, so so it you know it's interesting little uh, addition to it. After the Great Hunt, you really don't see it being all that important. I don't think um no they're they're used once more i think they're referenced previously but yeah that's about it but again we're we're, we're being uh introduced to things that, that that kind of everything revolves around this this circular motion of time where where things keep repeating and old things mm. are there and you know we forget things but also we relearn things and uh at the end of the day this is what i said we throw everything on its head rand went through this whole psychological process to be with his friends even though he wanted to get away and push them away and push them away but he kept getting put with them and now he falls asleep and he's away from them yep <laughs> so uh but loyal and hero are with him so he has to still be the leader uh yeah and and, and that's kind of the purpose of this little side quest is you you get you get to know loyal and her uh more and rand is forced to to do what he's capable of and what he can do rather naturally but he he doesn't want to acknowledge it any more than perrin wants to fully acknowledge his wolf brotherness mm -hmm. well again um, development of characters mm -hmm. the skills he developed taking care of matt in book one yeah that's now are coming point. out while he has to be a leader to people he don't know as well. Yep, that's a good callback to that. Yeah. Um, uh, we don't meet Solen yet, do we? Uh, no, because no. it goes into Perrin no. trying to use yeah, this his, is... his, uh, his thingy. 
this is a rather short chapter. That's right. And so they, they, they set off. They have a, they have a think, and then they set off uh, down the trail. Mm-hmm. And, and again, is, the, 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 the barrier between space and time. You know, we're seeing, we're seeing how thin that is because Perrin can still smell the trail. Her and can still smell the trail. He, he, her the, and can still smell the trail. Yeah, in the mirror were, world. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, it's different, but it's still there. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's part of um, Jordan's physics background. That um, physicists look at time differently than normal people mm-hmm. um, because it's just another structure if you well, will, and that, in the universe. To, to way oversimplify this, that's the quantum part of quantum physics, is things are in multiple places at once, and time is kind of something we just perceive versus something that is. And that, that it's, again, way oversimplifying it, but, mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, I think that's the easiest way to bring it out. So... Um. I do think it's interesting. One of the most interesting things about the beginning of this Wolf Brother chapter is here. Rand has just had this revelation with Perrin and Matt. So Perrin finds out that he's been hiding his one of his best friends has been hiding something big. Uh, and now Perrin's about to do it. But I, I don't know that I've ever thought about this before until now that. Perrin doesn't tell Matt. He only tells Ingtar what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Matt Matt has to think that Perrin's a sniffer like the rest of the Shinarans because that's, well, they're used to that. So we'll just tell them that, says Ingtar, which, you know, is logical. But it, it it is interesting and odd to me that Perrin doesn't even tell Matt. So he's, he's doing what he kind of just grumbled about Rand doing. Well, and Perrin also just witnessed Matt's reaction to Rand. Mm-hmm. So, uh, it, it, the, the, you know, when you see someone wig out at somebody, but you also got something to say, yeah, you might hold back a little bit yeah. because, yeah. and realistically, that, you know, from Matt's perspective, that's probably a good thing. Imagine getting two things that throw you on your head in a row. You know, we all kind of wig out a little bit, but then you get a second one, your reaction might be tenfold, you know. It's like stubbing your toe, you throw a little curse word out, and then 10 minutes later, you're stubbing the same toe, you might throw something and have a big mental breakdown for a second, and, uh, and now you've got two kind of world-changing events that could happen at once. Um, oh, and then at the end of that chapter, Varen pops back up, and <laughs> uh, oh, we all love Varen. I'm this is one of the most cited and quoted and debated chapters for a long time on on the old uh, message boards um because it is so odd and the way he writes it i think he's purposely trolling the reader here uh knowing that so as i as i mentioned last time with ran looking sideways at ingtar you're going to start looking sideways at everybody Mm -hmm. starting with this book because of i mean he he, the prologue opens with a meeting of dark friends i know we didn't really talk about the prologue but um because it's hard to it's hard to talk about that without giving away spoilers without talking about who these people are um but the prologue opens with a with a secret meeting of dark friends and then you know you get dark friends breaking in and stealing the horn with with help from the inside and oh, you're going to see right. more this you're going to is... see it more and more and a few more i thought it was the next book that had boars no this was the book with boars okay mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah it's the best prologue of them all i think it's 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 very interesting and very eye-opening especially with how the previous book ended mm-hmm. and so be, because of that and then because of the reveals you're going to start to get along the way here you're going to start looking sideways at everybody and there's something going on in in Varen's head here of uh da, 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 da. where is it where she shows up 
Well, I mean, just the statement at the, the last part of the chapter. It's Rand she's after, Matt murmured, not the horn. And Perrin yeah. nodded. Well, uh, okay, so 231 is when she rides up and Moraine Sedai sent me Lord Ingtar. Varen announced with a satisfied smile. So the 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 what nerds debated in circles for a decade what this meant because she's clearly thinking something in her head and we know because of the oaths that I said I can say things that aren't fully true if they can justify it to themselves mm -hmm. or just just like an I said I could lie to you if she genuinely doesn't know that it's a lie it's my favorite meat wad line I don't know if anything I just thought was true but I believe it <laughs> exactly <laughs> so uh so when you start looking sideways especially at the eye to die uh wondering who's black as jaw uh because i think one of the reasons oh, be, be careful became, we haven't been introduced to them yet <laughs> yeah well we know yeah. they exist okay <laughs> we, we know they exist and because because it's been it's been referenced before and because in that meeting with boars he saw a couple of different women who had rings Ring on. on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So, so we know they exist. And so now you're going to go hold on a second and you're going to start looking askance at all the Aes Sedai who you aren't, who you don't know for sure. And I think the reason it became such a, uh, a favorite pastime to try and guess who's black as before they were revealed is because you have a, a hard logical clue with, the three O's. If you can catch an Aes Sedai breaking one of the three O's, then you know she's Black Aja. She's somehow broken the, the oaths. So uh, this is going to come up again and again when we meet Varen and you start looking askance at her like you look askance at everybody else. Uh, and I, I'm pretty sure that was on purpose uh, in the same way that the most infamous um, event in wheel of time that caused all manner of arguments for decades to the point where I, I i won't mention it you probably know what i'm talking about but for decades jordan got questions of who did this thing and he just started trolling the audience he was just having fun uh trolling the readers uh, like beating around the bush and giving hints that weren't really hints. Well, he even trolled in the books fun. because of all the yes. clues. He would make yeah. an absolute statement in the books, but everybody would overreact to it. Yeah. My, my favorite comes later, and this this won't spoil anything. There is a character that it says, and death took him. Mm -hmm. And everybody was like, does death mean this? Or does death mean that? Or da, 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 da. is he going to come back? And all these things. And he just looked at the audience and said, no, he's dead. <laughs> that's what that sentence meant <laughs> yeah <laughs> but that's you start you start going in circles with some of this stuff and so that's uh that is something that's going to come up uh over and over again uh but then we go back to rand before so we're, we're left with kind of a cliffhanger there of, of varen suddenly getting serious which is always fun when she does that um and now we're going to meet Selene as they travel along in the mirror world for a little bit. And then, oh, well, didn't you know there's some random chick here? Wait, isn't that? It, random chick needs saving. Oh, wait, yeah. They, they, travel, they travel a little more. He has another creepy dream. And then in oh, the next cool, chapter. Cool oil moment when he makes the quarterstaff. Yes. Get introduced to tree singing. Yep. And which is um, actually a in a, a plot point that never gets wrapped up that and i think well, i don't know too much of a spoiler for me to go down that road but uh i'll tell you off air and you tell me when it's a good time to bring it in uh, but it, it, there is a there is a a plot hole or plot point that never gets resolved and i thought it was super important and uh I thought, and I had a theory on where it was supposed to go, and I, I never will know because the original author is dead, and the second author never closed that loop. Here, let me. 
for those that okay. saw the hiccup, we discussed what I thought was a spoiler, yeah. and we have decided it is way too much of a, a spoiler. So. Okay, so speaking of spoilers, not really a spoiler because we're about to have it explained. So Rand gets the first brand here before he meets Selin. Um, he, ha- he has a dream. He's holding onto his sword, and Balsamon covers him in fire, and when he wakes up, the heron from his from his sword hilt has been branded into his palm. Mm-hmm. Um, Which again, this... lets, you, lets you know everything's still connected because the world of dreams is still there. Yes. And it's still, it's still the same uh, balls among that was there in the other world. So. Um, and this is, this is going to come up here pretty soon of what the significance of this is. Um, and in fact, let me find it where Selene, because I want to read it specifically. Where is it? Um, so it's connected to a prophecy that she mentions. I think it's her that about the, the markings of the herons. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I had the thought of. Oh, I don't think that's right. Where in the heck is that stupid note? Uh, but no, but no, but no. I'm just gonna look it up. Do, 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 do. Okay, there's what it was. Okay, so just went to a Wheel of Time wiki because I couldn't find where it says it. it's gonna <laughs> it's it's gonna come up here in a chapter or two because Celine's gonna mention it and and Rand's gonna try and play it off. But uh, uh, twice and twice shall he be marked, twice to live and twice to die, once the heron to set his path, mm-hmm. twice the heron to name him true. And I don't know that I've ever really considered it in the context of when it happens <clears throat> what what is setting his path here what what path is being set that he's being marked now and is there is this just a general thing or do you think there's something significant right now when he gets marked Oh, uh, well, in that meeting, it's the first real meeting where Balzaman knows he is the dragon reborn. No, yeah, that's true. And he's no longer trying to figure out between the three of them, which one of you am I after? Well, and if I remember correctly, he gives them an ultimatum, come to my side or die basically forever. And, and also gives him a carrot of... I can keep you from going mad. And he doesn't take the bait. So then he gets burned. So he set his path of not going to the dark yeah. side. That, that, that's, that's as good an explanation as I can think of. Celine is an interesting character. And I'm hoping, I'm wondering about her in the show. Because just like we talked about with Galad, first of all, how are they going to cast what's considered the most beautiful woman this guy has ever seen. Yeah, and what everyone thinks when they meet her. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's one of those I'm concerned about. Although I did see the headline on, on one of the things today that uh, Elias is apparently in season two. A little too late, sure. but better than nothing, I guess. Sure, why not? Sure, why not? I bet you, he, 
season two seems like when I'm seeing these little headlines of what's going to come in or who's going to appear, it's like, we're going to do season one the way we do. And we're going to look at the complaints and then try to fill in the holes. That's what it seems like, but. Yeah, could, could, could be, could be, who knows. Um, uh, so let's, let's jump to Celine now. Um, that she is, she is interesting because she's, she manages to be multiple things at once. Like she's, she's confident, she's intelligent, but she's also good at playing the coy coquette, mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and using her feminine charms to kind of push men in the direction she wants them to go. Uh, and she, she balances that with the, uh, with kind of the, the mental uh, de- debating and convincing. So she, she balances all these things. She's, she's, she's a very multi-layered person, very multi-layered character um, that I just, I, I have absolutely no faith whatsoever that they're going to do her justice. Um, I mean, she's got, she's got loyal, uh, kind of eating out of her hand and he's, Mm -hmm. you know, he's a, he's a pretty sharp dude. Um, and, and yet he, and when you talk about Ogier in general, part of their slowness is they detach themselves from emotional reactions. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they try to take a step back and look at everything logically and talk it through before they make a decision talk it through at length before they do anything and she's got him within seconds kind of doing her bidding Mm -hmm. and so that's kind of this it's the she is the definition of charisma yeah is what she is and then which which adds to rand's character because she she will from time to time push him too far and he'll dig in and he'll put his foot down Mm -hmm. um but then you see, you see her reaction, and I, I do think it is genuine. I don't think she's playing when when she kind of reacts with a laugh and a smirk, and and you know says a few different times she says something to the effect of you know stubbornness can be good. A, a man who's too easily led isn't worth having. You know mm-hmm. things things of that nature, um, and I. I do you think that reveals a lot of of who she is and what she is? Well, we've got even, we've, even though we don't know for sure quite yet. Well, we've got two two dualities here too. We've got so it's it's pretty easy to see even without revealing anything for the future mm-hmm. that Celine is trying to manipulate Rand. Yep. Uh, but also we have Moiraine manipulating Rand, and now we see the different strategies that go along with it, and which one's mm-hmm. more successful on Rand. So Moiraine tries to make him feel like he's free, but you can see the strings she's attaching to him. And Celine pulls the, the, she's very good at pushing him as the stubborn mule, but then using that stubbornness against him yeah. later. Where Moiraine keeps falling into the trap of being blown up by his stubbornness. Instead of trying to, so Selena is trying to redirect the stubbornness. Mm-hmm. Uh, Maureen is trying to beat the stubbornness out of him. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a. Uh, they both understand the stubbornness. They're attacking yes. it in different ways. Maureen yes. is again trying to give the appearance of freedom to attack the stubbornness, but every time she gets caught in that act, it reinforces it. Whereas Selene. Mm-hmm once it comes up and becomes a problem she just pushes it in the direction she she's more like the river just yeah. guide it let it let it go in in the in keep let the river keep going but kind of make it go in the direction you want where moiraine is trying to damn it and you know that's, that's something i hadn't uh thought of before but we're going to see it more later uh but it 
it's pretty well established that one of the major influences for Carheen is um, Fr- France, uh, specifically Louis the Sun King, mm-hmm. uh, that era of, of France, um, late medieval, early Renaissance France. And that's where Moraine comes from. And there's, a, there's an interesting contrast between Brits and French. And, and you can see it. I don't remember who I first heard use this analogy, but so if you, if you look at their enlightenment era philosophies, they're very different and you can see it in their gardens. So if you think of the classic uh, French Royal gardens, like the gardens of Versailles, which are all very regimented, um, they are works of art, uh, but they are, but they are very geometric. Okay. A British garden is much more natural and wild looking. So it's, it is tended, it is sculpted, but it's tended and sculpted in a way to let nature be its best, to to let nature be at its best versus the controlled idea of the French garden. For those that want a deep discussion on this same concept, go back to our uh, geographical uh, differences based on, uh, or excuse me, personality differences based on geographical location and, mm-hmm. and, and expansion. That, that would actually kind of play into that same conversation as well. Uh, but another, the direction I kind of wanted to go with Celine here with the discussion with Moraine is study cluster B personality types. And uh, a good source is Dr. Uh, Romani on YouTube if, if you're surfing the interwebs. But the way they manipulate people, you've got two different kinds here. And she's, she kind of, in, in, a, in a way, is, is a very stereotypical borderline personality. Yeah. And, uh, it, it, and, and it shows right here. But they're, they're also, they also tend to be master manipulators because uh, something that goes along with it tends to be also very high IQ as well. Uh, but when you look at it from that light, it, it's... And then you find out uh, things along the way. It makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, you brought up the three of them. It it is funny to see how she plays all of them in different ways. She plays the lady to Huron, who is a follower. Mm -hmm. He's he's a typical follower type uh, character. Then you got Loyal, who is usually slow to think. But he is slightly adventurous, loves his books, loves knowledge, wants to get knowledge on a firsthand basis. And she shows that part of her to him. She's like a colleague to him. Not almost. only that, she out knowledges him mm. in some ways. And he's blown away by that. He's yeah, more not, like a professor than a colleague. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's not he's used very to someone being more well-read than him. Especially since he should be, you know, uh, 60 years older than she is. Right. And then... Uh, and then Rand, who is in, in, in his own way, the protector, he's the country boy with his, with his little country boy co- coat of honor, you know, and she plays to that, but then keeps putting in the sexuality where it's needed. And, and then as soon as, as soon as that stubborn streak ha- happens, look at how she responds to control that stubborn streak, play the victim. Mm-hmm. And again, bring up, bring up those uh, cluster B personality disorders Playing the victim is a huge part of their manipulation. Uh, For those that missed the sexy time with Sam talks, dating advice for you young men out there. If a woman says, just trying to live in a man's world, run. That is, that's that's number one red flag. You're dealing with with someone who's going to use that tactic on you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just a little free advice there. Um. So when they leave the mirror world, there's a couple of things here that jump out. Uh, first of all, the flame in the void. You you have a very a very uh, sharp example of what can be done with it. When he puts arrows in the eyes of these charging beasts from mm-hmm. quite a ways away, and also keep in mind that when when they kind of first brought up the flame in the void. Rand mentioned that his dad is even better with it than he is. Mm-hmm. Okay. And 
and so so Tam won the archery contest every year at the at the Beltine Festival using this technique. So he's even he's even better. And and you mentioned that with the the foundation, the background for why Rand is able to become a competent swordsman to the point of sword master eventually very quickly. He already had that foundation. He already had that mental foundation, mm-hmm. um, which which then comes back around, co- comes up again when when they leave. And page two sixty eight, <clears throat> they're back in the real world. Remarkable, Celine said slowly. She glanced at Loyal and Huron. The ogre looked stunned, his eyes as big as plates. The sniffer was squatting with one hand on the ground as if unsure he could support himself, support himself else. All of us here and all of our horses, and you do not even know what you did. Remarkable. So it's a, this is someone who's, you know, without, without, I think, I think even first time through, there's a pretty good guess of, if not who exactly what Celine is, um, but she's obviously very knowledgeable. She obviously has some degree of power herself of some sort, and she is genuinely impressed and surprised by mm-hmm. what Rand does here. Mm-hmm. Um, that it is it is no easy feat, and he's he's doing it subconsciously he's he's doing astounding things so uh it it's it's yeah, more she, she did guide him in some ways yes in this yeah, she, one yeah but uh but yeah he, here's he, the symbol for this here's the symbol for that yeah. do this he still doesn't even know what a weave is yet yes that's a good point that's a good point because we we know what weaves are from the girls learning how to how to channel and what what channeling means how you you take these threads of different types of power and you put them together in more and more complicated ways the more and more complicated a thing you want to do now i might be just justifying a a plot hole but the way i kind of read it here to where it's not the same as you it'll just happen was because the portal stones were not created by the Aes Sedai yeah that all you needed really was the power it's supplying the battery to the machine that's already it, there it's supplying it's supplying the raw power and knowing mm-hmm. which buttons to push mm-hmm. and Celine helps with the button pushing and he's and he has tons of raw power even if he doesn't fully grasp what he's doing mm-hmm. so the, so the specific weave didn't matter it just mattered that he put the the juice in mm-hmm. so, so that's the way I justify it there you know uh it's as good as any again we can't ask him well it mm. you also get because he he did mention a little bit when he talks to lan at the in the sparring scene that he uh he can't he can't always do what he wants to do i mean it's mm-hmm. it's there and well and, and we saw it um when he tried to get back right away is he he couldn't he did it he didn't know what to do he he couldn't even get hold of the power mm-hmm. and that that happens periodically as he's still trying to learn is yeah sometimes he does something astounding because it's there when he needs it but most of the time it's not so he he and we're you know no spoilers here but you're gonna see it at the very beginning of the next book is a couple times he needs it boy does he need it it's not there mm-hmm. you get, he, he's got nothing so it's also balanced by that, um, which which is something that in the books is is something Moraine kind of explains when she's mm-hmm. talking to not even Egwene about how the power works is it, it it's not just there when you need it. It's you have to train, you have mm-hmm. to practice or it you're not going to be reliable with it. Mm-hmm. Just like any skill. Yeah. If you if you've never played basketball before, try to hit a free throw. You're gonna miss more often than not, but the more you do it, the more consistently you can. Mm-hmm. Do you hear that, Shaq? You could have gotten better at free throws. <laughs> His yeah. whole career, he's like, I'm doing everything. I'm trying every different technique. I'm doing it. And then finally, when he retired, he goes, I never worked on free throws. Which oh, I'm shocked. 
I mean, yeah, say. It, where he was on the scoring list, and you take, you you get make him twenty percent better. He might be the all time leading scorer ever. Yeah, and and to be someone that is purposely fouled so much. I don't know. I love Shaq because he's he's a great commentator and I love watching him play. But to me, that was pure laziness mm. because you could have helped. You would have probably had three more championships if you could hit 20 percent more free throws. Yep. All right. Back, uh, to, the book. back to the book and we, we jump back to the girls. And so oh, yes. uh, this is the scene where uh, the Amarillan herself is going to train them. And Nynaeve loses it. Um, and and it's kind of what we were just talking about. It's impressive, right? When when she when she loses her temper and she's got so much raw power, and she does learn pretty quickly because she has so much raw power, it's easier for her to craft these weaves. So if she sees another Aes Sedai doing something, she can figure it out. But the Amarillan still gets the upper hand because she's the one that's got over 20 years of experience, 20 years as a full Aes Sedai, and then, you know, five, 10 or so before that as novice and accepted doing the training. So she, she still gets one up. Um, but one of the things that jumped out at me, and I, I mentioned this before about one of the reasons Jordan is probably verboten uh, in the woke crowd <laughs> I've been triggered. <laughs> um so one of the reasons he he's no good for the woke crowd is because there are no perfect people. Just because you're a woman doesn't mean you can't be arrogant and myopic. Which is, is kind of also what you get here in this scene with the Amarillan being rather kind of arrogant um, with and, and uh, you know, arrogant and misogynistic. It goes both ways. Uh, it's, it's, it's why I said I was so shocked at that very opening scene of episode one of the series is uh, Leandrin was that way. And I was like, oh, wow, they're, they're going to put the, they're going to put this part of the novels into the show and they, they didn't really but well, that's why i still call her the best played character in the, yeah, in the whole thing yeah best best played and best written character because I they think. made her human yeah that's a good point they they made her human which is why all of the characters in the book work is because he does a good job even for the ones you only see for a little bit of making them human and and one of the ways that plays off is is, is in the gender roles that that men are from Mars, women are from Venus, so they can't always see uh, where the other is coming from. And they also both have their biases, right? That everyone has a bias based on any number of factors and the prioritization of those factors are based on the individual. But everyone is going to look at something from a bias and you have to be cognizant of that if you don't want that bias to be a problem, to interfere in what it is you're trying to do. And we've, we've used training analogies before of, you know, uh, my bias is towards, you know, neck pain and, and uh, neck stability and, and posture and all that. And I, if I'm not careful, I will go too far in that direction when everything's a trade-off. And if I have someone who's more athletic and is trying to achieve, you know, some degree of athleticism, I'm going to have to shift a little on that because you're going to have to move away, do some more, some riskier things that I wouldn't do for myself or wouldn't do for a desk jockey. But, you know, I got to, I got to push that bias aside sometimes. Oops. Okay. Uh, we can get back to the girls uh, next time because when we, when we finally come back to them, they're they're in the tower proper and they've begun their official training. And so there's a lot more to it there. Well, this um, is where it becomes difficult to kind of go chapter by chapter. Yes. Chronologically, because there's so much back and forth now. This is where Jordan starts to to branch out to completely different settings versus just a different point of view here and there. Right. So. Yeah. So there's there's it's not just, you know, <clears throat> so even when we first get that split 
when they got split up at Shadar Logoth, it was still, they were still all kind of in the same area, moving in the same direction, mm -hmm. right? Uh, between between uh, not even more rain and Perrin and Egwene and Matt and Rand, they were still all kind of on the same path, on the same quest. Now it's something completely different going on, uh, mm -hmm. and that's just going to get more so as as more plot points start to happen and more characters start to uh, get more screen time. Um, the the chapter where uh, chapter nineteen where Rand sneaks in and gets the horn. Uh, I there's a couple of cool things that jump out at me here. First of all, writing action is difficult, mm -hmm. and Jordan's very good at it. Um, very, very rarely have I ever had to reread a passage. And, I, and I've read a lot of fantasy books and not every author is good at it to be sure. And there are, there are quite a few authors where I have, I'll go, wait, what? I'll have to back up and I'll have to read, reread the last couple of pages that I just read to get an idea of, of what actually is going on. Mm -hmm. um, very rarely do I do that with Jordan. Sometimes I'll reread it because it's cool. Uh, but I can really see it in my head. What's going on here. Um, I also, I like that you're seeing the progression of Rand here. So he's, he's fighting Trollocs in the dark and he's able to take them out relative easily, relatively easily. So he's not a blade master yet. He's not worthy of the Heron yet, but you see the payoff of what was set up at the very beginning of the book mm -hmm. with all that training with Lan. Um, and then you, you start to see the, the psychosis starting to develop where he's a, uh, I mean, he's downright suicidal here. That's what he's doing. He's he's wanting it to be ended now. Uh, I think we could take one quick step back because we also see a progression where he's starting to not think of Egwene the same way. Because mm. you get some inner thoughts where after Celine touches his arm and everything, yeah. he's like, she'd cheer me like a sheep, but then he's still thinking about Celine. So... He's, he's so, starting to stray away from his betrothed, uh, his, his, what was seemed like his destiny from the beginning, yeah. which is now being turned on its head. So. It's kind of what we talked about uh, previously when we talked about the relationship of it's, he feels guilty, but it's a guilt out of obligation, not out mm -hmm. of real sentiment. Uh, I thought I had another thought there, but it's gone now. Um, and then when they, uh, when they get back, this is one of those scenes where he puts his foot down and says, no, you're not going to look at the horn now. We've got to keep moving. Um, and, and Celine gives him kind of the, uh, smoky eyes and says, "All right, I'll let I'll 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 let you win this one, basically, mm -hmm. uh, because I decided to." Uh, but then we get to the big honking statue that we will find out in a few chapters what that actually is, and there's this very odd scene with Rand standing there mumbling. Mm -hmm. And the statue st staring and mumbling at the statue. But so far as I can tell, nothing is happening uh, to anyone else, right? Yes. Nobody else sees anything. So the, 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 that crystal globe that the statue is holding isn't lighting up or anything. Um, and so Loyal and Huron are just really confused, but Celine is terrified mm -hmm. at what just happened. Um, genuinely terrified. Uh, I think an important point here that uh, going forward is a concept I want to put a bug in people's ear is it, I think some people miss this when they read through is that Sadar and Satan, the power 
is actually organic. And so it's not just my wanting to use the power. The power is wanting to use me. Mm -hmm. And so there, there is actually a back and forth with that. So again, we go back to the, the free will debate. Are a lot of the things he's doing because he's using the power or in this early stage where he has no control is the power using him. And now that he's at this, this juncture where the power is, is so intense, it's going to have a greater hold over what he does. That's a, that's a good point because both male and female channelers will, will uh, say something to the effect that the power calls to them. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and in the, in the metaphysical world, the, the power is referred to as the power that drives the loom. It drives the wheel mm -hmm. that makes the, the pattern that makes the fabric of reality. So it is, it is uh, intimately intertwined with the pattern. Mm -hmm. So it, it makes sense that there's going to be uh, not necessarily a will of its own, but it is, it is something more than just, you know, plugging into a, an electric socket. Well, and, and going, going back to even the end of the uh, Eye of the World discussion we had, we were talking about the voice, the, the all caps voice. Mm -hmm. Why I don't think it's the creator is because, because of this back and forth with the power that, that the, the mere humans get that have the ability to access it. I think the power itself is the creator. Hmm. And the creator does try to bend will, but also through it has to do it through the vessel of, of man. Man being man and woman, man being the, the human. And uh, so it, 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 of course, that's my big, deep philosophy going forward through all of it. But uh, but yeah, it, it, it definitely does show an organic nature where it does want it to seem to take control of its own. Uh, as we go as we go forward um let's move on along here i think we can get up to this uh finish off these chapters uh before we get to back to the white tower and then we'll pick up the white tower next time um So we get it. We get into the this inn here of this village, and we're still a little ways outside of the capital. So you get a taste of the skeevy schemers that are the Karhinen that are going to become kind of a meme uh, as as the series goes on of the the game of houses uh, that's being played here. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and then Celine is going to disappear. Uh, which we, we, we kind of talked about that this, this is, this is her thing. This is who she is. Mm -hmm. Well, you see a little stumbly moment where Rand is trying to, uh, his, his country bumpkin shows out again when he's trying to deal with the, the innkeepers. Mm-hmm. And he's in a place now where everybody reads way too much into everything. And he's trying to speak straightforward, like where he's from. And because of characteristics about him, that reading becomes exceptionally overemphasized because it's like, no, you're not from the two rivers. I know you're not. You're tall with red hair. And that's what she's thinking in her head. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so again, yeah, we're again weakness in the character. This is this is part of the development. He's still not well versed enough, even though he had that travel time through Andor mm -hmm. to handle Carhine yet. Yeah. And and there, <clears throat> there's 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 pros and cons because there is something beneficial in his uh country boy straightforwardness, but it can also get him in trouble. Sometimes, you know, that straightforwardness helps him navigate. Uh, simply because he's just going to stay on his road, but then sometimes that straightforwardness is going to cause problems, and Huron and Loyal are going to have to go. Eh, don't, don't don't do that. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and it's going to get worse in the next. Actually, no. Hold on. 
that is the end of that. That's right. Okay, so actually we should stop there. Uh, because the next chapter is the one where Moraine is off with the old ladies looking at stuff. And there's a lot of there's a lot of meat in that chapter. Okay. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and even though I've been just kind of going by memory, I'll read that trap chapter. So let me mark it real quick. Yeah, so we'll 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 pick up there. Uh, it, it may be difficult to talk about because there's a lot of spoilery things in there mm -hmm. um, because they're talking about they're talking about the prophecies and the dragon and all these things that are going to come to fruition later. Um, but there's there's still a lot of interesting and cool things. And you're you're we're gonna meet two again two smaller characters that are really interesting that are going to disappear and then pop back up later and be really important again. So. He's he's Jordan is setting the stage for a lot of things here in this chapter. Well, and we're really getting to a lot of meat now that we're coming across prophecies and philosophy and, yeah. and everything that there might be a lot of spoilers coming forward. So let me play with I'm, I'm still an amateur at the video editing, but let me play with it to where maybe I can add something that you can you can scroll ahead. Mm -hmm. Like uh, when I watch Dark Horse podcasts, they do their 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 ads and they'll have a kind of a box around them while they're doing the ad so i can scroll ahead until i get to where they're not doing ads anymore so maybe maybe we we can do something where you can tell there's a spoiler and you can scroll ahead uh because it's going to be really it, there's so many things already that have been so hard to talk about yeah without spoiling the rest and i can't even say read ahead a little bit because we could be spoiling something from book 10 yeah um, absolutely so, yeah. so that's uh so let me play with the, the software a little bit and I'll try to do that. Otherwise we'll just stick with the jazz jazz hands uh, going forward, but uh, good place to stop. No politics today, which is actually kind of refreshing. Yep. Uh, we'll talk Ukraine probably the next time, uh, which is okay though, because th there's a lot going on right now and letting it marinate for a second is, is sobering in, in its own way. So you know, there's so many reactionary things we could say, but just let it marinate, let it kind of sit there for a second and then let some of the truth bubble to the top. Again, just the social distillation analogy, right? In distilling, not that I know from firsthand experience, it's about having it just the right temperature, right? Not just turning it up to 11, because if you just turn it up to 11, you get basically the same thing on the other end uh, or even worse and uh or you burnt you burned your wash so it's about having just the right temperature and i think the ukraine thing uh is sensitive because uh to steel man the opposition we don't know what propaganda the russian people have had over the last several years and we can go back to our own history recent history most of us yeah. were alive then with iraq you know wmds and all these things that turned out to not be true but we were all behind it or not all, but the majority of the country was behind it. And uh, we don't know what they've been exposed to, what their experience is, and uh, same for Ukraine. Uh, so we don't know the propaganda that's been going back and forth, the propaganda we've been getting, if it's been skewed or not. And I think when a major event like this happens, it could bubble some of that up to the surface. Uh, uh, and we, we can't just go, Russian bad, Ukraine good. We don't know that. Might be the case. I don't know. Uh, a good example uh, that I kind of came up with here is it, it may not even be that cut and dry. If for some strange stroke of luck, China decided to be a little bit more humanitarian and invade North Korea, that might be something we could get behind, even though we've got so much negative thoughts about China at the moment. But North Korea is fucking shit. Yep. And so we don't know what the situation is. Uh, hopefully, hopefully some more stuff becomes clear. Unfortunately, a lot of the best in investigational journalists have been focusing on COVID and Canada lately that they haven't been focusing on this thing that we should probably know a little bit more about. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's my thoughts on that. We'll probably go deep into that. I know Heath's got the uh yeah the 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 skinny on some of that stuff because it's my focus has been on the medical end uh and then yeah cool i guess we'll see everybody next time
All right. Later. Later.